Hello, yeah. welcome to uh, numerical methods. So today I like to combine uh, a little bit the numerical methods we have discussed so far. So what I like to do is uh, in the last session, we've seen that we can uh, calculate an approximation to a partial derivative by a very simple finite difference. Yeah? For example, center finite difference, upshift, downshift. Uh, you know, take the difference, divide by the shift size, you know, two times the shift size. Okay, and uh, we also had a session on calculating expectations using the Monte Carlo methods. And today the question is, okay, what happens if I would like to calculate a partial derivative of uh, some valuation that is performed using a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, the Monte Carlo method. So think of the Monte Carlo method being a big black box. So we have here some some numerical algorithm. So that calculates uh, the expectation of some say function of a random variable. Okay, uh, using the Monte Carlo approximation. So maybe I call that E hat. So that is defined as just do some sampling. So let's write here x of omega i. And this is the value which I calculate using the Monte Carlo method. And now assume that this uh, black box that does all the stuff depends on the parameter. For example, the parameter could be the initial value of your stochastic process that generates x at a certain time or uh, the sigma parameter, the volatility parameter, or whatever. So there is some dependency here on a parameter. So let's call this uh, parameter here theta. And maybe this parameter theta enters somehow in the calculation of the x. Then we can ask ourselves, okay, what is the change of V if theta changes? So I would like to calculate the partial derivative dV by d theta. So with respect to this parameter theta. Okay, and uh, we have uh, in the previous session, a numerical method to calculate the partial derivative. So the partial derivative can be approximated by calculating the valuation at a certain parameter upshifted, theta plus h minus the valuation at a certain, at this parameter downshifted, theta minus h divided by two h. Okay, so I have two numerical methods and now I would like to calculate the partial derivative of evaluation where the valuation is performed using the Monte Carlo method. And there will be, if we do this in the computer, again, uh, surprising effects. Yeah? So similar to uh, what we had before when we saw that, okay, for, for in some cases, maybe we cannot choose h as small as possible because there are some, some issues with the uh, computer arithmetic, yeah? with the accuracy of the computer. Um, a motivation why I like to look at dv by d theta when v is an expectation 
is in mathematical finance uh, given by the calculation of the hedge ratio. Uh, well, let me shortly uh, mention this motivation, but the stuff that we do in this session and in the following session is really independent from uh, mathematical finance. Yeah? So it's just a question, what happens if you like to calculate a partial derivative of a value that has been obtained by a Monte Carlo algorithm? So for this uh, motivation, I will shortly discuss here the prominent example from mathematical finance. And then in this session, I, I would like to make a small introduction that we see, okay, where is actually the issue? And a very nice um, example is to compare um, a linear and a discontinuous payout. And once we have uh, understood that, also with the small numerical experiment, then we can look at different methods of calculating this partial derivative, um, well, a very classical finite difference or the so-called pathwise differentiation, the likelihood ratio method or Maria Werner calculus. Okay, so a motivation for mathematical finance. Well, I sometimes cited the uh, universal pricing theorem. Okay, and that comes from the so-called risk neutral valuation. Well, what's that? Yeah, you express the value or uh, yeah, you express the value of a financial derivative as the cost of performing a so-called self-financing replication. So it's the cost of setting up such a self-financing application portfolio. And all the theory uh, that leads to um, the universal pricing theorem is actually based on, on, on this uh, replication approach. And in the end, you have a very nice theorem that tells you uh, that you can express the value of this replication portfolio or the cost of setting this up uh, as an expectation. If you determine the, rep the value of this replication portfolio in this way, actually it's not needed to determine uh, the replication portfolio itself. Right? So you have just the final result and you do not need to de determine uh, how much unit of the stocks do I have to buy, how much unit of the other assets do I have to buy. You do not need to de determine the portfolio. So we have here a way to express the cost of this self-financing replication portfolio, say some function V, some value V as an expectation, say the value at the future point in time divided by the numerea at evaluation time multiplied sorry, divided by the numerea at uh, maturity, multiplied with the numerea at the evaluation time. So that is the universal pricing theory. Um, but if you like to know how many units of a certain asset, for example, a stock, you should buy for to perform this replication, then the partial derivatives with respect to the current value of the stock, so which is an input parameter to your model, is exactly the amount that you need to buy. So the replication portfolio can be given in terms of partial derivatives of this valuation, so the V above, with respect to your model parameters. So an example, dv by d is zero corresponds to the amount of stocks s
that you have to buy to perform or to set up the replication portfolio. as part of the replication portfolio. So when a trader likes to do the replication, he is buying dv by ds units of s, and that is the amount that neutralizes the risk. Yeah? The, the change in, in V. Okay, so you see in mathematical finance, there's a very natural um, application where I have the problem of calculating the expectation, which comes from the universal pricing theorem. And I'm then interested in a partial derivative of this uh, expectation. So for many complex product, this expectation has to be done numerically. So for example, for a Bermudan option or also for some uh, Asian options, we do not have an analytic formula. So an analytic formula is not available. So we have to do it numerically. Then if the model is a high dimensional model, so we have some model that creates a very rich market. Yeah? For example, in interest rate models where, you have, where we have many different interest rates or we have an option on many different stocks. Yeah? So if the model is a high dimensional model, then we usually use a Monte Carlo method, a Monte Carlo simulation to calculate this expectation, to approximate this expectation. So you see that the expectation here will then be a Monte Carlo algorithm and we are calculating a partial derivative of a Monte Carlo value. And the next step is that maybe we like to approximate the partial derivative using our very simple numerical method of finite differences. And what we see today in a nice example is that unfortunately doing this can lead to strange results. Uh, it depends a little bit on the payoff payout function. So this is then the setup from mathematical finance. So we usually calculate here the value of, oops, So we calculate here the value of a financial derivative coming from the universal pricing theorem as here an expectation. And we are interested in partial derivatives with respect to some model parameters. And depending on well, the parameter, these uh, partial derivatives have special names. For example, uh, the delta is the partial derivative with respect to the initial value of the underlying stock. So the S0 in our Black-Scholes model or Bachelier model, or the Vega is the partial derivative with respect to the parameter sigma, so the volatility parameter. But you can calculate all kinds of uh, partial derivatives. So you see that in mathematical finance, we have a very natural um, application where the two numerical methods come together. Okay, so now let's go back to the general setup. Uh, 
calculating a partial derivative and later approximating numerically a partial derivative. of a value that has been obtained using some Monte Carlo algorithm. So just maybe a black box. Let's shortly review this black box. So shortly have a look at the Monte Carlo valuation. Okay, so our setup combining multiple um, numerical methods that we have looked at so far uh, starts from say for example a stochastic process x so i have a stochastic process x for example given as an eto process so this here is my eto process x this process depends on some parameters so there is, for example, here the initial value as a parameter, but also there is the sigma. Okay, this is a function, but maybe sigma is a constant. Yeah, then this is a parameter or it is a function that depends on some parameters. And this models our model primitives. So in our application of a Black-Scholes model, it could be that here the x is the stock and the bank account or if we like the logarithm of the stock and the logarithm of the bank account so next step is that we perform a time discretization of this stochastic process so we arrive at some approximation x star at discrete times so x star at tj, where we calculate x star at tj plus one using here our Euler scheme. So we have a time discretization scheme. So this here is just the Euler scheme for this stochastic process dx is mu dt plus sigma dw. Okay, and from that we get, given some time discretization, a time discrete stochastic process, so a family of random variables. Then in many applications, we are interested in calculating the expectation of a function of some of these random variables, so some of these realizations. So define now the vector y as being some of these realizations at certain times. Then I'm interested in calculating here the expectation of a function of this y. If you think of, uh, the universal pricing theorem yeah, of mathematical finance for European option, it will be just X at capital T. So it is just X at a certain point in time. Well, also maybe as a function of the Lumarea. So you have maybe something that looks here like this, that just expresses the quantity of which you like to calculate the expectation. Um, but many financial products are of this type. So this is already a very fairly general setup. And now we combine the approximations. So I like to calculate the expectation here of a function of this vector y. y is a vector consisting of elements of x at different time, x itself could be a vector. Yeah? So it's just a vector of some random variables. Mm -hmm. So first step is that y is approximated by y star. Yeah. 
which is my time discretization scheme. Okay, so I have my Euler scheme approximated random variables x star here. And from that, I calculate a function f. And then I take the expectation. And the next step is to approximate this expectation by a Monte Carlo integral. So I have a second approximation step. So this here is now my Monte Carlo approximation. So in the end, I arrive here at um, the Monte Carlo approximation of a function f uh, of a family of random variables. And this family of random variables can depend on some parameters. So the parameters, for example, that enter here in the stochastic process, initial value of the stochastic process, or something that is hidden here in the sigma. Okay, so next step is I like to calculate now the partial derivative with respect to this parameter. So you can think now of the Monte Carlo valuations as a black box. Yeah? So you have some parameters, initial value, sigma, whatever, and it pops out this um, sampling of the random variables taking the function, taking the expectation. And now I like to calculate the partial derivative with respect to these input parameters. Okay, let's first look at this problem purely analytically. So without uh, approximating the partial derivative. Uh, to illustrate this, let's assume here that we have some parameter theta. So I can now call this model parameter theta. So this model parameter can be anything, the initial value x zero or some parameter that enters into the sigma or whatever. So then let y subscript theta denote this vector of random variables that it's generated by our black box. So the Euler scheme and so on. So well, with the Euler scheme, it would be Y star, but don't, don't, don't care for a moment uh, about uh, this. Okay, so let's, let, 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 uh, let, let have now Y star denote the model realizations that depend on this, this theta. And now assume to illustrate this, that I know the density of this random variable y. So I know here there is phi, and this is the probability density of y theta. Of course, the probability density will also depend on the parameter theta. Um, if, for example, theta is just the initial value of the stochastic process and the stochastic process is just the Bachelier model, then this theta is just a shift of the mean. So it is just a shift of the density. The density would be the normal distribution and we just shift the density around. So what I'm interested in is the partial derivative with respect to theta of the expectation of a function of y, y, y theta. So now if I have a density, then I can express the expectation as an integral f of y times phi 
of y dy, where here the y is just uh, the state variable. I assume here my vector of the random variable is m dimensional, so then this is just something from Rm. Okay. And now you see a nice thing. So the function f can be discontinuous. But the dependency on theta is now here in the, oops. In the density and in many applications, the density is smooth. Well, maybe not in general, but in many applications, the density is a smooth function of theta. So in that case, I have a convolution here of f of y, phi of y. So in that case, the expectation is also usually smooth. a smooth function with respect to theta. So somehow this expectation, so the gray stuff here, uh, gets its smoothness from the density phi, even if f is a discontinuous function. So let me make a small illustration here. Assume that, for example, the function f is just an indicator function. So f is, f of y is one if y is larger than k otherwise zero. Okay, then this means that expectation f of y is just, okay, integrate the density from k to infinity. So this is just one minus the distribution function phi capital phi of k so, and the distribution function now depends also here on theta. Yeah? So this is just the distribution function. Okay, so, and the distribution function, for example, for the normal distribution depends smoothly on the mean or the variance or whatever. Okay, so if you have a parameter that enters there, um, well, the expectation can still be smooth even if f is discontinuous. Okay, so that's uh, a nice thing. The reason is that uh, I have theta here as a model parameter. So it is a parameter that is inside the model and the models are usually quite nice. Yeah? So they have smoothness in their parameters. What happens if you now take a look at the Monte Carlo approximation? So let's consider the Monte Carlo approximation. So the Monte Carlo approximation, here my E hat, applied to f of y theta. Okay, so this means that I take f of y theta at certain sample passes and take the average over these sample passes. 
So one divided by n, the sum over all i, f of y theta at some omega i. Let's now differentiate the approximation. So on the previous slide, I differentiated the expectation. And now let's differentiate the approximation. So what is d by d theta of e hat? of my Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation of f of y theta. So this means I just differentiate my Monte Carlo algorithm. So I just differentiate the sum. So this is differentiate the sum over all sample passes f of y theta of omega i. Yeah, then I can interchange this as summation and differentiation. And this is just one divided by n, take the sum and now differentiate f. So this is the chain rule, f prime of y theta of omega i multiplied with dy theta, so how does the random variable depend on theta by d theta? Uh, yeah, hence you see that I'm differentiating the function f. So what happens here if f is discontinuous? So if f is discontinuous, you see that I have just a finite sum of discontinuous function and a finite sum of discontinuous function is discontinuous. So I'm differentiating here a discontinuous function. So we will have this again, but if I draw the picture again, Assume that you have this discontinuous function, the, the indicator function. And then you have some sample points, y theta of omega i. So maybe these sample points are here, 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 here. And then you differentiate the sum of these sample points with respect to a small change. So this here is actually y, yeah? with respect to a small change in y theta of omega i for a theta. And if y depends smoothly on theta, a small change means you move a little bit to the left and the right here. You see the derivative here is zero for every point. So this here, f prime at a certain, will be zero at every point, except here at the point where it is not differentiable, there it will be something. Uh, so you see that the Monte Carlo approximation is actually always wrong. No? So if this here is a null set, so I will never hit this point, then I'm just calculating zeros here. And I'm just summing up zeros here and I will always get zero. We will later see that uh, the analytic 
uh, while the analytic formula here has a problem, the finite difference may still work, but it will perform poorly. So in this case, a finite difference approximation applied to the Monte Carlo valuation will perform poorly. And to illustrate this further, a nice example is to now look at uh, the linear and discontinuous payout. So by payout here, I mean the function f. In the expression, calculate the expectation of f of y, where y may depend on some parameter theta. And I will discuss now what happens if f is a linear function. This is some proxy to f is very smooth. Uh, and what happens if f is discontinuous function. And I believe the example will illustrate uh, actually a lot. Okay, so the challenge becomes obvious if we consider the two very simple example, the linear and the discontinuous payout. So I also make the example a little bit more simple that f, uh, that y is now just um, x of t. And y and hence this x depends on the parameter theta. So for example, this theta is here some model parameter. So an example for this. Just consider this very trivial Bachelier model where r is equal to zero. So I just have that dx is a scaled and shifted Brownian motion. So x at capital T is just x zero plus sigma w of t. So this is just a scaled and shifted normal distribution. So then we could for example, consider theta is just the shift of the distribution or theta is just the standard deviation. Yeah. So standard deviation would be sigma times square root of t. So just the volatility parameter. Um, okay, so and now here consider the case where the function is just the function f is just a linear function. So now here I have x of t and f is just some linear function having slope a and a shift b. So what happens if we calculate expectation of f of y theta? So expectation of f of y theta, this is a times a times y plus b. So expectation of this is a times expectation of y plus expectation of b plus b, differentiating it with respect to theta is just a times expectation of dy by d theta. So what happens now? So that's just the analytic solution. So what happens now if we look at the Monte Carlo approximation? So I replace now the 
E the analytic expectation operator here by the E hat, my Monte Carlo approximation, and I'm differentiating the Monte Carlo approximation. So again, as before, the Monte Carlo approximation is one divided by n, the sum over f of y theta. Differentiating it, I can interchange the sum and the differentiation. So I'm just differentiating um, f of y theta. This is a times y theta plus b at a fixed path omega y. So here I have that this here is a times y theta at a fixed path omega y plus b. So differentiating this, I get inside the differentiation of y on this path omega i. And you see that this is just the Monte Carlo approximation you can move the A in front and you see that you have just here the Monte Carlo approximation. So this is just my Monte Carlo approximation of dy by d theta. So the nice thing is that you see that the differentiation just gives me that it is the Monte Carlo approximation of the analytic differentiation. So I would expect that as long as the Monte Carlo approximation of this random variable here is okay. Yeah? So then this approximation here so the differentiation of the Monte Carlo approximation is a nice approximation. So actually it's not such a big problem that I'm differentiating here an approximation. So it only depends on if So it only depends on the variance of dy by d theta. Yeah? So the Monte Carlo approximation depends on the variance the accuracy depends on the variance of the argument of the random variable. So it depends here on the variance of dy by d theta. So if this is good, oh, this looks ugly here. Then the Monte Carlo approximation should be just fine. Uh, Okay, that is just differentiating the expectation if f is a linear function. Now, what happens if f is a discontinuous function? So let's consider here the discontinuous payout. So f is the indicator function. Uh, it is one if x is larger than k, otherwise it is zero. So in mathematical finance, you would say that this is a European digital option it is european because i'm just looking at x at a fixed time and it is digital because it just has two different values like an indicator function so a very very uh, common financial product, yeah, digital option. So let's look at this guy. Okay, to um, understand the analytic value, uh, so what, what it means if I differentiate the expectation of f of y theta. So we are interested in, yeah, so again, we are interested in d by d theta 
expectation of f of y theta. Okay, so we are interested in that. To um, actually uh, understand that, let's assume that I can do a Taylor expansion of this uh, y theta in terms of theta. So I have here a small Taylor expansion that y theta plus h is y theta plus how does y theta depend on theta dy theta by d theta times h plus higher order terms o of h squared. Um, if I have this, then if I look at the indicator function f of y theta plus h, so y theta plus h larger than k is equal to one, gives me one. So this is one if y theta plus h is larger than k, zero otherwise. Okay. Then I can use here the Taylor expansion in this criteria. So is y theta plus h larger than k? So this means is this stuff here larger than k? Okay, so then I can move dy by d theta times h plus o of h squared to the other side. So actually this criteria here is the same as is y theta larger than k minus dy theta, uh, dy by d theta times h minus o of h squared. Yeah? So this here is exactly the same as y theta plus h is larger than k. Okay, just plug in your um, Taylor expansion with the o of h squared remainder term and move this guy and this guy here to the other side. Okay, so you see that um, the expectation of f of y theta plus h is just the expectation of this indicator function. So actually this is just the probability that this criteria holds no? expectation of indicator function is the probability that this I'm in this set. And this is because this criteria here is the same as this with my tail expansion, the probability that y theta is larger than k minus dy by d theta times h minus o of h squared. Um, or expressed as an integral with the density this is integrate from k minus dy by d theta times h minus o of h squared to infinity here the density. So looks a bit ugly, but if I have this, I can now calculate the partial derivative of this expectation f of y theta because this is just the limit of the finite difference approximation f of y theta plus h take the expectation minus f of y theta minus h take the expectation and you see, this is just the difference of the two integrals here. So you see that this is just the integral from k minus dy theta times h up to k plus dy theta times h. So if you like to have a picture of this,
Here's my K. Here's my K minus dy by d theta times h. Here's my K plus dy by d theta times h. I drop the O of h squared part, okay? So, and then you have the density that you integrate. Oh, maybe the density looks like that. Okay, so what is the integral that you are calculating here? So you are calculating here the integral. So this integral is approximately the value of the density at the center point. times the size of the interval. So the size of the interval is 2h, but if you calculate a finite difference here, you divide also by 2h. So you see that this is just the value of the density. at k, well, multiplied with the size of the interval is dy by d theta times h. So the size of the interval is two times dy by d theta times h. So you see there is here the dy by d theta times h. So divided by two h gives you another dy by d theta. So this here comes from the size of the interval. Okay, so you know that if you differentiate now uh, expectation of f of y theta, actually what you get is the density evaluated at k, so at the jump point, multiplied with dy by d theta. So this here is, if you like to have a um, little bit of intuition, this here is the velocity, so the speed by which the jump location moves. So if you like to have a different picture, yeah, so you have here this discontinuous function and there's the density here. Okay. And if you now move this location here a little bit to the right or to the left, okay, you are moving through the density. You are moving through the density and this is the amount of density that you get. And this is the speed at which you move through the density. Okay, so that was the analytic part. Huh? So now we have an intuition of what happens. Huh? If we differentiate the expectation of a discontinuous function, we expect that we get the density at the jump location of the discontinuous function multiplied with the speed by which we move with the jump through the density. And you see that all these guys here are they behave well, yeah? I mean, the density is maybe a smooth function of theta, and this here is just your model. There's no issue. So now let's do that again for the Monte Carlo, yeah? So I already mentioned that if we differentiate the Monte Carlo approximation, let's paint that maybe in red. If I differentiate the Monte Carlo approximation, okay, I can interchange 
summation and differentiation. And this is always zero. Assuming that I do not fall uh, into the jump location where the function is actually not even differentiable. So maybe I can draw the picture again here. So you take the average of differentiate what happens if these values here move, but if they move, they are either always one or always zero, as long as you stay away here from the jump location, the derivative is always zero. So the Monte Carlo value is always wrong. Okay. So you see that the, these two guys behave very differently. While for the linear guy, you actually see that differentiating the approximation just gives you the approximation of the differentiation. No? So it doesn't really matter. Here, you get a completely wrong result. Let's have a numerical mass uh, experiment uh, where we try to apply finite differences to these two situations and see what happens. It looks a little bit as if it is not allowed to apply finite differences to a discontinuous function. So what happens? Okay, so let's uh, conclude with a small experiment. So I just create here in finite differences a new class. Uh, let's call this, uh, well, I, I do a Bachelier model. Monte Carlo simulation. And from that I calculate partial derivatives, which I sometimes call sensitivities. So let's call this sensitivities experiment. And have a main method where we try some stuff out. The description of my numerical experiment is here in the script. So I just like to have a very simple model. In mathematical finance, you would say that it is a Bachelier model. So this means here, x of t is just, I had this before, x zero plus sigma w of t. So it's just uh, the random variable is just a Brownian scale shifted Brownian motion. Uh, so it's just a normal distributed random variable. And from that, I calculate the expectation of a linear function applied to the random variable and the expectation of a discontinuous function, indicator function, just as we had it. And I do that, I approximate now the partial derivative um, using here our classical centered finite difference. Uh, and let's try this with very simple values. So I use sigma equal to one, t equal to one, k equal to one. And then I use different initial values. So I calculate the partial derivative at different initial values. So actually this is now minus four and plus four standard deviations. Yeah, sigma is one, uh, time is also one. And I use this with different shifts. So let's try different shifts here. Uh, yeah, very quickly uh, try this. Um, so let's define a few parameters. So um, I would like to have a volatility sigma parameter of one. So I mentioned that. I would like to have uh, a, a maturity parameter, so time capital T time also of one. So uh, this means my initial time is zero. Um, this is zero. So then I would use different number of passes. So, um, so what do I have on the script? Uh, let's take very few passes. Um, so just take 10 passes. just take 10 paths for the 
Monte Carlo simulation. The Monte Carlo simulation also needs some, some seed for the random number generator. So just uh, think of some seed. And I would also like to use um, a shift size for the finite difference approximation. So this is say 0.5, uh, so a fairly large shift. Uh, or maybe we use a small shift. But you know from the um, experiments that we did before, we should not use two small shifts. This is a 10 to the minus one, two, three, four. Yeah, so that's maybe okay. Okay, so not use a 10 to the minus 16 or something like that. And um, I would like to plot now the partial derivative dv by dx zero in, so for different initial values, uh, for different initial values, say from minus three to, to one. So let's plot this for the linear function. So let's write some, some method that creates and shows this plot. Um, I have to define my A and my B, assume B is zero and just assume a scaling factor this is my A, my linear function. So the scaling is say seven, whatever you like, and then define the function. So I have a double unary operator. So this is the function, the value uh, of my expectation as a function of um, the initial value. So um, the initial value should map to Okay, so now I need some function that gives me the random variable. So let's call this function here, get realization. Say at maturity, whatever you like. So this is your stochastic process, your model for a given initial value. So I need to actually create this here. And this should return a random variable. For a given initial value. So this is now my X of capital T. Yeah, so just calculate that. Um, so of course, I can use now a little bit the stuff that we, uh, let me check. Do, uh, so what do we need? Brownian motion, okay. A time discretization, I see. Okay, so of course I can use now the, a little bit the stuff that we uh, did uh, before. So I can use a Brownian motion here. So this is a new Brownian motion, say from a Mersenne twister. Uh, for that, I need here a time discretization. So the time discretization, say I use a time discretization with some initial value. That's the initial time, the number of time steps. It's just one time step and the time step size is then maturity minus initial time. So that it's just maturity, but because initial time is zero. So I have that second argument of the Brownian motions is the number of factors. It's just one dimensional, then it's number of paths and the seed. Okay, so that should be my Brownian motion. So then my random variable is the Brownian motion, the Brownian increment for time zero. Okay, so this is the W of T. So this is multiplied with the volatility. Okay, this is one. And then I add the initial value. And this is the value that I return. Okay, so this little helper here calculates 
this x of t, which is x zero plus sigma w of t. Okay, so now I have the x of t, apply my linear function. So I multiply this guy here with the scaling factor. Then I take the expectation. And from that, I take the double value. Okay, so that's here is very shortly the expectation of a times x of t. So maybe I can just uh, plot this. Uh, yeah, there is a nice, nice client function that I can use. Uh, the the 2D plot. Uh, I would like to plot it from minus three to say five. This is the different values of the initial value. And then I would like to plot the function value. Okay, and I can show this, this plot. Okay, so maybe let's let's run this. Okay. That's that. Let's try again. Okay, so let's run this guy. Okay, so you just see a linear function, yeah, for different initial values. It's just a times expectation, and the expectation is just the initial value. So it looks very nice. Um, maybe I add a little bit of um, description to the plot. So what is that? This is now the valuation of the expectation a times x of t. So a is seven. So this is the initial value of the x. So the initial value x and then subscript, uh, I believe subscript zero is that guy. Okay, so this is the initial value which we plot. And of course, the expectation is just a times the initial value. Let's calculate the derivative with um, a finite difference, okay? And I would like to calculate a finite difference using this shift size here. So this is my Okay, so this is now my derivative. So let's call that a delta because it's the derivative with respect to the initial value, sometimes called delta. This is also a function of the initial value. Okay, and what is it? It is the function, the value evaluated at initial value plus shift minus evaluated at initial value minus shift divided by two times the shift size. So divided by shift divided by two. Okay, so that's just the function that applies the finite difference to the black box, which is my Monte Carlo expectation. And uh, plot this guy. So this is now the delta, which I like to plot. And it is the finite difference approximation. Of the partial derivative. So 
So let's plot this. Okay, and you see it is seven, yeah? So there is not even a change here in the value. So it's, it's, just, it's just a seven. So we get exactly seven. Um, that is now the exercise for the linear function. And you see there is no issue. I can get the exact derivative, which is the analytic value would be the seven. Okay, it is seven times expectation. Expectation is the initial value. Seven times initial value. If you do it, if you differentiate with respect to the initial value, it's just seven. So let's now plot the discontinuous function. Maybe fix typos here. So I'm a bit lazy. I just copy here the code and just modify it accordingly. So for my discontinuous function, I need here a strike parameter k. So it's indicator function if I'm larger than k. So let's have a strike parameter here, the strike k. Let's use k equals one. So then my function is not this guy here. So it is, is x of t larger than k or otherwise if x of t minus strike, is this larger than zero or not? If it is larger than zero, I would like to have one. Otherwise, I would have, I would like to have zero. Okay, so now this function choose here requires that the two arguments are random variables and not just uh, uh, double numbers, but there is a small helper that creates a random variable out of a constant. And so I have to write it like this. So this function choose here is just the indicator function is x, is x larger than zero, then it is the first argument, otherwise it's the second argument. Okay, and here my indicator is x of capital T minus k. Okay, and from that, I like to calculate the expectation. And get the double value. Okay, so that's my indicator here. Then I plot here the indicator function. So this is indicator x larger than k. So I just fix the description, okay? Uh, the function of the initial value, okay? And then it's just, again, the finite difference. So maybe also here, I fix the description and I have a nice plot. So let's plot now uh, the two experiments again. Uh, there's some error. Ah, uh, here there's a semicolon missing, okay. So let's plot now the two experiments again. So. Left-hand side, the smooth and linear function, everything looks nice. Right-hand side, my indicator function. Okay, and if I differentiate, I get here always zero. So exactly as I mentioned, I get always the wrong result. Because what's that? Okay, that guy looks a little bit like the distribution function. Yeah. 
expectation of the indicator is the distribution function. And here as a function of the initial value, uh, differentiating it, I get always the zero. Uh, well, let's increase the number of Monte Carlo passes. Okay, maybe this is just because the number of Monte Carlo passes is not enough. Let's increase the number of Monte Carlo passes. Suggestion in the script is use 10,000. Let's run with 10,000 Monte Carlo passes. Okay, and you see, well, now it looks really nice here. It really looks like a smooth function. It is the distribution function, but if I differentiate it, I get really bad stuff, okay? So finite difference applied to this indicator function looks very bad. Uh, let's make the shift size a bit smaller, uh, larger. So let's make the shift size now a bit larger. Let's make it 0.5. So that's really fairly large. Wow, and now it looks okay. So if you differentiate the expectation of the indicator function, I would expect I get something that corresponds to the density. Here it is the density. Yeah, The density just shifted here with the initial value, um, and now it looks okay. So you see that there is a similar issue than we had with computer arithmetics. Um, a small shift gives me really wrong results, and now it has become worse. Uh, small, 10 to the minus four is even too small. Okay, so I have to use a very large shift, and the size of the shift somehow depends on the number of Monte Carlo passes because if I go back down to 10 now, okay, so you see it, it looks quite okay. Yeah, even if I use 10, um, even if I just use 10 passes, it already looks okay. So what you see here is, this distribution function is piecewise constant because the indicator is just jumping across every path. Yeah? So if I move this location of the jump, he's just collecting more and more passes. And you see there are actually just 10 jumps. Okay, this is 10 Monte Carlo passes. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Okay, so the reason that the differentiation is so poor is because this function here is a piecewise constant function and this piecewise constant depends on the number of Monte Carlo passes. And now you understand that there is a link between the shift size and the number of Monte Carlo passes because this will somehow relate how many passes are within a certain shift. So to conclude this session, let's elaborate this with a few formulas. So of course you can uh, experiment here. This stuff is in our Git repository. Yeah, you can play around with this. You can also maybe differentiate with respect to other parameters and Let's look what happens if we calculate partial derivative by finite differences. So I will now uh, have slides that all, always look very similar. So I start on the left-hand side with my problem, calculate a partial derivative of a Monte Carlo expectation.
But the way I work to the right hand side is different. So in the next session, we will have different options. So, but if we do finite differences, then this means I perform a finite difference approximation here. So one divided by two H, evaluate at the parameter theta plus H, evaluate at the parameter theta minus H and take the difference of the two and then one divided by two H. Um, second approximation step is replace the two valuations with the Monte Carlo approximation. So you know here my E hat of something is one divided by N takes the sum of this something at omega I. Okay, so that's my Monte Carlo approximation. And you see that actually I'm performing the finite difference of the two Monte Carlo approximations. Then I can collect upshift on pass omega i minus downshift on pass omega i and take the average of that. So a finite difference to applied to a Monte Carlo approximation is actually the pathwise finite difference and from that the Monte Carlo average. So what you see here inside is the pathwise the pathwise finite difference. So on every pass, I'm shifting up and down and taking the difference. And from that result, I take then the average. So applying finite differences to a Monte Carlo simulation is actually a Monte Carlo simulation of the pathwise finite differences. Uh, this is a very nice method because actually you have no additional requirements at all. So here additional information or additional requirements means that in addition, to being able to value the expectation for different parameters. for different parameters theta. So it just means if you have a black box where you can enter a parameter theta and you get out the value, then you can apply this finite difference here. Yeah, because you just apply your finite difference to your black box with a parameter theta plus H and with a parameter theta minus H. So I do not need any additional information on how X was constructed how X star was constructed. So what is the model of X? What is the numerical scheme use? I do not need any additional information of F. And actually I even do not need any additional information of what is theta, is it initial value or what? Um, we will later see other methods where actually I need additional information on one of these guys. Uh, for example, um, if you know F, F prime, the derivative of F, then maybe you can do something special. So finite differences is, is a very great method really, yeah? but it has issues. Uh, if the H is large, we get an issue from the Taylor expansion.
So the remainder term, so we like to choose h small. Uh, if it's large, we get this error. But if h is small, then we have in some cases for discontinuous payoffs, extremely large Monte Carlo variances. And I will explain uh, explain this now. Yeah? So we already saw that in our little toy experiment that there is an issue if the function is discontinuous. And I, I will um, explain this. So good thing is that um, if the payout is smooth, then we can choose small shift sizes. So our example with the linear function but if the payout function, so the function f, I always call the function f the payout function. If this is uh, discontinuous, then it may lead to differences if we choose uh, very small h's. So it doesn't even converge, yeah? So we get zero in every point. So there's an issue. Um, Okay, so that's just um, a, a summary yeah, um, that we would like to choose small, small shift sizes. And let's look again at the um, linear and discontinuous payout. So let's understand why the output was like we saw it. So example again, finite difference applied to the linear function a x of t plus b and the discontinuous function. So indicator function is x larger than k, then it's one, otherwise it's zero. So the first example, uh, the linear function. So let's work from left to right. I would like to calculate here the partial derivative of the expectation. I approximate the partial derivative with the finite difference. So the first approximation is here the finite difference, upshift minus downshift, okay? Then I replace my valuation with the Monte Carlo. Uh, so you could also interchange that, that's not a problem. So I have a finite difference of two Monte Carlo valuations. So then I know that this is just the Monte Carlo valuation of the finite difference. And now plug in the function f. So f is just a times y plus b. Okay, and you see that this is just a times the finite difference applied here to the argument. So if this finite difference is a good approximation for dy by d theta, then everything is fine. So you see uh, the function f doesn't break anything up. It's just if dy by d theta has a good approximation by the finite difference, then everything is fine. So for the linear payout, I see that the criteria is just that if the model is smooth, I don't care about the function f, yeah? f is, is okay, it, f, f doesn't break anything up. The interesting thing is now what happens if we have the discontinuous function? So for the discontinuous function, the same steps. So I have a Monte Carlo approximation of a finite difference applied on every pass. So this here is the pathwise finite difference. Uh, 
Okay, and now the function f is discontinuous. So let's draw a small picture. Here we have our k. So here we have our k, then I have this discontinuous function. Okay, and then I'm calculating f of y theta, theta plus h, theta minus h. So assume that your sample points on different passes are here. So this is omega one, this is maybe omega two, this is maybe omega three, this is maybe omega four. And then you perform an upshift minus a downshift of the parameter. So assume that if you shift the parameter up, you move to the right. So maybe you are here, upshift on omega three, upshift on omega one, upshift on omega two, upshift on omega four. And if you shift down, then you are moved to the left. Okay, so I move to the left. And you see now you take the finite difference of these guys. So if you take the finite difference of these guys, then here you will get a zero because the difference of the green point and the red point is zero. The value did not change. Here it's also zero. Here it's also zero. And here it is actually one. Okay, so I have actually a difference of plus one if theta plus h crosses the boundary and jumps up and theta minus h is on the other side of the boundary and jumps down. So I have here in this situation, a contribution by a plus one. If it would be the other way around, yeah, that the upshift moves down and the downshifts moves up, it would be a minus one yeah, because I'm just flipping here the sign. In all other cases, it's zero. So I have now this triple indicator function guy here divided by one divided by two H because it is the finite difference. So I calculate now a Monte Carlo expectation of this strange guy here. So now comes my last slide. Huh? Sorry for the timing. Uh, what, what is this? Huh? What is the expectation of this stuff? So for simplicity, oh, I have two other slides. Okay, so for simplicity, assume that y theta is linear in theta, yeah? because then I can easily calculate when I jump across the boundary. So if y theta is linear in theta, so then I have that y theta is uh, y theta plus h is y theta plus dy by d theta times h. Yeah? Uh, so this here is the speed by which the location y moves. And then I can easily calculate if I am in the neighborhood of the boundary or not. So I have here the finite difference approximation. And this is one divided by two h times one if I cross from zero to one or minus one if I cross from one to zero or zero else. So whether I cross from zero to plus one and I have a plus here or whether I cross the other way around and I have a minus here is actually just the sign of this dy by d theta. Yeah? So is y moving up or is it moving down when I move theta? So I just can simplify this here. This is just the sign of this 
guy divided by 2h. And when am I crossing this boundary? So if I have here this um, uh, indicator function, then you know that if you shift theta by h, it means that you shift y by dy theta times h. So the shift that you are observing in y is actually dy theta, uh, dy by d theta multiplied with h. And this I now define as epsilon. So this here is k plus epsilon, and this is k minus epsilon. So if your value y theta is in this epsilon neighborhood, it means that either the upshift or the downshift will cross the jump. So I have a very easy expression for crossing the jump. I'm crossing the jump if the initial value or the value before the shift y theta is in the epsilon neighborhood of K, where epsilon is just here dy by d theta, okay, absolute value, so otherwise the interval would be flipped, times h. So now I have the following thing. If h is small, this value here is very large, but the probability to be in this epsilon neighborhood if h is small, is small. So I have a small probability to get a very large value. What is the probability to get this value? So what is the probability to be in this epsilon neighborhood? Well, it's just the probability that y theta is in this epsilon neighborhood. And I know what that is. This is just the density Approximately, it's just the density multiplied with the size of the interval. So multiplied with two epsilon. So this is just the density phi of K. So with the probability phi of K times two epsilon, I'm crossing the jump so you see if epsilon is small, there's rare cases that I cross the jump. And I then get this value here. So I get this very large value in very rare cases. So if you plug in the epsilon, this guy here is phi, the density at the jump, times dy by d theta, absolute value times 2h. So in other words, uh, this is a Bernoulli experiment. I have very rare cases where I get this value, and in other cases, I get zero. So in other words, I'm sampling the partial derivative of the expectation by a Bernoulli experiment. And the Bernoulli experiment is now that I get this value here, which is apart from the sign one divided by two H. I get this value with the probability Q and the probability Q was dy by d theta times h, uh, dy by d theta absolute value, ah, phi times dy by d theta times 2h. So you know that the expectation of a, a Bernoulli experiment is just the value times the probability. Uh, so actually, since the other value is zero, uh, so just the value of this outcome times the probability q. So then I get that this is the sine divided by 2h multiplied with 
the absolute value. So the absolute value will vanish because there's a sign and the divided by two H will cancel. So that's just phi times dy by d theta. So the expectation is just this. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back for a second. So this here is the expectation that I get in my Bernoulli experiment. So we get back to this where we looked at the problem analytically and you see this is the correct result. Okay, so my Monte Carlo method, my Monte Carlo approximation of the finite difference of the discontinuous function will get me in expectation the correct result. The Monte Carlo will converge to the correct result. Well, approximately, yeah, there is an approximation here. So there was an approximation here, which is due to the shift size. But what is the variance of the Bernoulli experiment? Okay, the vari variance of the Bernoulli experiment is the square of this value multiplied with Q times one minus Q. So that's here the variance. And the square of this is just one divided by two H. So you see that if you now multiply with Q times one minus Q, this is approximately something that is one divided by two H squared times H. This is something of the order one divided by H. And this will explode as H goes to infinity. So you see that the Monte Carlo approximation has a variance which will go to infinity if I make H smaller and smaller. So the Monte Carlo error will become larger and larger. So you see there's a big issue here. Monte Carlo, uh, to, to make it convergent, I have to increase the number of passes. Finite difference to make it accurate, I have to make H smaller, making H smaller makes the Monte Carlo variance larger. It requires more Monte Carlo passes. So what is a good value? So there is a, an issue for discontinuous functions. So that was it for using finite differences applied to Monte Carlo expectations. And uh, in the next session, if we know a little bit more about the model or about the function yeah, or about the parameter, then we can actually improve uh, this uh, situation. That was it for today.